Andrew, and thanks for your ongoing work in relation to this very, very important issue. Um, the Mental Health Commission were um, a number of months ago in this very room, and I asked this very question in relation to their report, and their report was, to say the least, it was quite damning and un unsettling in relation to the provision of CAM services. And I asked the question, is CAMS in its present format reformable? Now obviously, you're, they, gave, they gave me the answer and so forth. Now obviously, your group is called Families for Reform of CAMS. But do you believe in its present um, format that CAMS is reformable in relation to the services that your children are not getting, and thousands of other children are not getting. I suppose we can't because you know, kind of, we're not the HSC. We haven't got corporate governments. We don't know, you know, kind of how these structures work or, or whatever else. Um, but I would say that um, it has to be reformable for our children and our grandchildren and whatever else. There has to be some form of reform, and I think that reform comes from legislation and then if we got legislation to monitor you know kind of the mental health sector then you've got accredited bodies You're, you know you've got you know kind of um, health accredited bodies will go in and best practice starts then so hopefully it is reformable you know yeah. kind of that's what I would yeah. yeah yeah and I suppose maybe just to add to that you know when we were kind of coming up we have 10 key reforms but we also have 31 sub reforms so we're I suppose not trying to solely focus on the problem, we're trying to put forward what solutions we think would bring the system um, you know, up a notch and offer a safe system. I think certain things probably do need to be looked at beyond CAMS, which is the interaction of CAMS between other services like the CDNT, and whether there should be some merging of services, I'm not sure. That would be a bigger overhaul. Um, for ourselves, we focus very much on reforming CAMS because we think there are some key things that can be done there. Um, but they need to be done urgently. Yeah, okay. And I think one other um, stark, worrying um, statistic we have, I suppose, come to with our own work here, and it's, it wasn't an, an awful shock, but the level of private service has been mm. sought by families where they cannot access care through the state. So they're, mm. being, they're on waiting lists for CAMS or they're on waiting lists for OT or whatever it is. They go privately. That sector is largely unregulated also. So you have parents paying out money hand over fist for play therapy sessions, for um, counselling sessions, but there's no regulation of that system. And it's forcing families into poverty mm. because they will... And Bernardo's have evidence of this. Families that are choosing to get their child their weekly therapy session rather than pay an ESB bill or pay for, you know, buy their full grocery shop. That's really worrying. The other thing that's very worrying, and again, there are a number of our members who've had this experience firsthand, where they have not been able to access services in Ireland. Their children are in crisis. They're watching a child fall apart before their eyes. Parents will do everything for their kids. Um, they'll go overseas to seek help. And that is happening, happening in an increasing manner in the country. Um, if you had another medical need, you would probably access care through the North or through the UK, and it would be covered by the state. You might get to go overseas for other medical treatments you need. That isn't available to our children. And what's happening is you have very worrying um, statistics coming forward where parents are paying for online assessments where they're meeting with the psychiatrist in other parts of Europe they're travelling to those destinations they're coming back with a prescription for very severe drugs that they're putting their children on with no medical oversight and we've had instances where parents have been trying to contact those providers in the overseas jurisdictions after the event not able to access them not able to get through to them and they're now faced with how do I renew a prescription how do I wean a child off a drug that they're having very bad effects to? And these are, this is happening. And th that is really worrying also. So parents are going to serious lengths here to look after their children. And the state is failing them. Yeah. Very and that badly. was my kind of next question in relation to, you know, the private sector in relation to assessments of needs and so forth. How kind of um, confident would you be in relation to certain kind of uh, groupings and, uh, I suppose, individuals in relation to assessments? 
do you have it, it's quite arbitrary in, in, even when you looked at the mental health kind of commission report they said it was there was no regulation at all mm. now if there's no regulation at all in relation to assessment of a child mm. well, the alarm bells are ringing in a serious way no and they, they have to be they have yeah. to be and i suppose the other thing that's quite stark. I mean, you know, if you take the example of a child with ADHD, they get, the parents get a private assessment because they hope that that might accelerate their child's acceptance by CAMS. And yes, it just, might. Just by the way, how much would that assessment cost? It can cost oh. anything from €800 Euro to €1,500 Euro right. at a minimum. At a minimum. Right. And as we laid out earlier on, you've got going from possibly from a two year old up to a 12 or 13 year old and you're each one's of those assessments. You can pay up to 10,000 euros yeah. for an assessment, therapy, assessment, therapy, because it'll start off at speech and language, it'll go to OT, it'll go into um, educational psychologists, to clinical psychologists, uh, to psychiatrists, to private psychiatrists, and then you will meet the door cams and they will say, we have to reassess your child because we don't know what kind of assessment you've had. Yeah. And you could have had rolled out 10,000 euros up and, that. And that may not be accepted? by yeah. the complex, as they say. 99.9% it, it, of the time we are told that those assessments will not be accepted, they will oh reassess. That's unbelievable. Mm. So, so parents feel, I suppose, in their belief, getting an assessment, it might open the door, it'll open the door, but they're back to getting a reassessment on. So they've really wasted their money, is what it boils down to. Spending all that money, getting yeah. all the assessments and so forth, and all the therapy, that when their child eventually gets into camps, that... The, the, you know, the, the process the, starts again. And that could wait for another year or two years, depending on the area, for well, reassessment. Is, 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 is the case that, you know, when they're in CAMS, and the child is in CAMS, when they have them assessments, is that the, you know, the professionals that are in CAMS will not accept them assessments, or they think it's kind of the wrong diagnosis or the wrong path? Well, I suppose I, I, it's a combination of those and I suppose as the professional the CAMS are saying and you have to uh, agree with them there's no regulation on the outside yeah um you know kind of so they want to reassess however there's plenty of of very good um psychiatrists and psychologists on the outside who do very thorough assessments but they're being reassessed when they go into CAMS mm. so it's yeah okay so you could see it's how it could be hugely problematic and we're out kind of regulation in relation to services that you know that parents and children have to go to. Um, as the the mental health commission reports that there is very very few, very little regulation. But again, how concerned are you in relation to that fact that there is very little regulation when you know parents are paying huge amounts of money in relation to services? Massively concerned. Yeah. It's frightening when you hear, I did not, you know, kind of, I, it's only until the Mental Health uh, Commission report came out and uh, Professor Lucy saying that there's only 1% of mental health services in Ireland um, regulated. Yeah. Um, that's... Well, it's incredible, really, because 99% is not regulated. Not regulated. So you need regulation for everything. I was listening on the radio the other day and there was, um, uh, there was somebody talking, uh, the minister talking about regulation of electric scooters, yeah. and, which is fantastic. However, you have no regulation of mental health what, services. What does this actually mean in kind of reality? If 99% of these services are not regulated, what does that actually mean? You know? Is it there's some of these people that are, you know, are saying that they're, you know, they're A or C or A or B, they're not, they're not A or B or C. But they're it, not, you know, trained to be, to make that assessment. But if you've nobody regulating or no one standing over looking at your, um, uh, at your work and, you know, kind of uh, looking and seeing if it's, it's, it's best practice, so you, I'm not saying it is, but it, you could do anything. Okay. Yeah, unless, you know, kind of everybody has to have an accredited, um, you know, kind of in any form of general um, medicine, you have to have a, a an overbody, yeah. an overarching government. And at the moment, that is not the case. Yeah, and, and also, I suppose, from, a, you know, a learning perspective, you know, anybody who's in a, medic, a regulated medical sector will be doing their annual continuum professional development courses. They're obliged to keep up to date with best practice. So if you have an unregulated system where people are providing other services that are mm. unregulated, you have no guarantee that it's best practice. Yeah. And there's nobody keeping a watch on it. Okay. 
Okay. And that's but meanwhile, parents are stretching themselves to provide these services to their children in, in the hope that they're doing good. And just finally, on the, as you're stipulated there earlier, on, in relation to parents going over overseas to other jurisdictions in relation to assessments, is, that's, is that widespread or is it it's, kind of... It's becoming small? widespread. Okay. And what other jurisdictions would they be? There's a lot in Spain, you know, kind of in other parts of Europe, um, depending where the psychiatric services are. And again, as um, Emer said, you've got children going on controlled drugs in Ireland um, from, you know, being prescribed by psychiatrists in different countries. And in that... Gino. Okay, just, just to find it, when that child comes, when they get the assessment and that medication is prescribed, when they come in to say... Uh, the CAM services would then, um, I suppose, the assessment change in relation to how that drug is prescribed? Or? Yeah, okay. they mightn't accept the, 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 the initial assessment. Okay. I suppose just to say as well, it's often children who have been refused by CAM, yeah. so it's the parents who can't get into CAMs are going and they're to desperate. other psychiatrics, uh, uh, psychiatrists across Europe and getting the diagnosis from them. Um, they've been told there's nothing wrong with their child by CAMs. Okay.